Hey, this is Josh Wagner with, with REI 360. Wanted to welcome you to today's training. Today we're going to talk about something that if you are a, uh, a real estate investor with any experience at all, you probably have had some trouble with, and that is contracting. Um, dealing with a contractor, whether you're doing a fix and flip uh, investment or you're, you know, you're just dealing with a, uh, a rental property that needs some sprucing up from time to time. Um, I've gone through this. I came from a construction background. I was a general contractor. So I've been through this. I've made tons and tons of mistakes with the contractors and what uh, I, I'm going to just share today. What I found works, um, you know, finding, screening, hiring, and then managing uh, good contractors that, you know, even if you do make a mistake or they screw up, it, the money and the time is not going to end up uh, costing you the project. So, all right, uh, without further ado, let's talk about finding contractors. If you are new to the business, even if you're not, you're just looking for an additional contractor, there's a couple different sources to go out and look for them. First, you know, referrals. If you're an investor, go to your local REI uh, or you know, real estate club, talk to other investors, see who they're using, see who they like. I've found that typically investors will share information about a contractor that is for large projects. They won't necessarily do the same thing for a handyman. Handyman, good handyman, are hard to find. If you have one, hold on to them. So, you know, that's, that's the first place I look, is look for a referral. You need somebody to do some drywall, call up your buddy. You need somebody to do a roof, call another investor. You know, find somebody that can be referred that somebody else has used first. Second of all, we're going to look into uh, Craigslist, Angie's List, um, you know, third-party websites, referral websites that, um, you know, where contractors can post and you can read reviews about them. Craigslist, you, you can always, you'll get a hundred phone calls, but when you're using a, a place like Angie's List, um, Yellow Pages or Craigslist, something like that, where you really have no basis, you got no background, you got to make sure that your screening is done really, really well, that you stick to your guns and you make sure that, um, you know, the, any, any work that's being done uh, you have screened this person right. So let's talk about screening. When you're doing, when you're going through the screening process, there's the basics that are going to eliminate a good 50% of, um, of the candidates. Let's, let's say we start with a Craigslist ad and we get a bunch of responses. We're looking for somebody to G GC um, a large rehab project. Well, you probably get 300 results because let's face it, the, the economy is not the greatest. You got a lot of people out of work, and you know, for some reason, everybody thinks that uh, they're a contractor and that you know they can put a roof on or you know put in a new kitchen, whatever. So, first thing we're going to look for, we're going to look for insurance. When you're looking for insurance, this is to cover your butt. You are looking for general uh, liability and you're looking for workers' compensation. They need both. If somebody gets hurt on your job site and they don't and they're not insured, you're going to be the one holding the bag. You can get around this if you know somebody that um, does really great work, you're really comfortable with them, you can get around this by getting an additional policy uh, on your rehab, getting a, um, you know, an additional liability policy to cover the workers that are working there. But just two cents. Next thing we're going to look for is a licensed contractor. We want to make sure you know, different states have different regulations. Um, the state that I'm in, Pennsylvania, they have a statewide licensing. They used to it used to be municipality by municipality, but look into what the regulations are. Make sure that the contractor does have a license because if you need to pull a permit, uh, something like that, you can't do that without licensing. And then third, it's really a benefit if they have experience working with investors. You really are not necessarily looking for somebody that is a retail contractor, somebody that's going to charge you six or eight or a thousand dollars to put in one window. That's not what we want. We're looking for people who understand that we are in this to make a profit. And obviously they have to make money for themselves, for them, their family, they gotta pay their bills, but we gotta pay our bills too. They, we want their pricing and their work to be commensurate with the type of project that we're, you know, that we're, they're hiring them to do. Once we've got the people that are you know, responding to our ad that meet these criteria, let's talk about the interview, all right? Um, you wanna make sure, just like really any, anybody else in your success team, you want to make sure that your personality match with them. If you've got, this is an intimate project, we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars. 
it's the type of thing where if you don't have at least the basics of an understanding and agreeable uh, personality with this other person and an agreeable communication and things like that, it can boil over for no reason at all with no problems. You know, this is a, this is a stressful uh, part of the business. So make sure that you have a personality match there that at least you can stand each other. <laughs> you know, if you can build a, a, um, uh, some level of friendship, that's a good thing. Uh, however, keep it professional, but also make sure you know that, that you have some kind of personality match. Clearly communicate during the interview your expectations. That includes your expectations on payment schedules, the process, the scope of the work, and ask, hey, is this something you're comfortable with? Have you done projects like this before? Um, you know, you, you might find out that somebody responded to your ad. He's great with windows and siding, but he does not do roofing. He's never put in a kitchen before, never, never laid tile. That's fine. You got a kitchen, you know, a, um, a window and, and door guy, but you don't have a, uh, you know, you don't have a roofer. You don't have a, this, that, or the other thing. You got to look somewhere else for that. Make sure that you're matching somebody that has done projects like this with the type of project that you're, you're getting involved with. Um, step number three in the screening process, I call this trust but verify. What do I mean there? I'm sitting in an interview, I could tell you that I, you know, about all the projects I've done and how great of a contractor I am and how inexpensive my work is and how everybody loves me. That's great. Love to hear it. Now, let's talk about some recent references. You t I need a list of five to seven people who you, you've worked with. And when I say recently, sometime in the last six months. Just, I, I need name, phone number, that's it. Call through them. Talk to them, see what works, see what didn't work. Did he show up, excuse me, did he show up on time? Did he complete the project on time? Was it on budget? Were there any problems along the way? Is there anything you wish you would have changed? These are the kind of things that you want to know going into hiring someone. Um, next, you want to do a job site inspection. Where's he working right now? You have a job going on right now? Let's go out and see it. We'll, you want to go unannounced. <laughs> you don't want to schedule an appointment with you. You want to say, where can I go and see some of your work? Oh, 123 Main Street down, down the way. Okay, you're going to be working there for the next couple days? Yes, I'm finishing up the job Thursday. Great. I'll stop by, you know, one of these days and, uh, and just see the kind of work you're doing. You want to come unannounced just so that you can see what his job site really looks like. The last thing you're going to look for are older references. These are people that he did work for in the last two to five years. Well, why older references? Well, because you want to know what kind of quality work he does. How long is it going to last? Did he install a roof, you know, three years ago and they had a leak? They called him and he never showed up. Or, you know, he, he gave them a, he promised them uh, some kind of warranty and it never happened. He got 90% done with the job and never showed up to finish the last 10%. Whatever the situation was, you want to know um, if there's anything that you need to know uh, for people that, you know, he, he's done work for in the past. Once now we've gotten to the point where we say, you know what, this looks like a really good candidate. Everything checks out, his job site looks good, he's got the paperwork he needs, um, he's got good references, let's move forward and hire him. That's our next step. Hiring process is um, you know, basically getting a bunch of paperwork together, and making sure your contract's right. What kind of paperwork do you need? Really simply, insurance deck page with you named as the additional insured. Whoever owns that house, is named as the additional insured. If it's in an LLC or a corporate name, have that name on the, uh, the declaration page. Have it faxed over to you from his insurance company with your name as the additional insured. What does that mean? The additional insured means that if there is a problem with, um, let's say he's working on your job site and um, the house burns down and he's got to file a claim, your name is going to be on the check for that claim as well as his. It prevents, um, in, in, in addition, you are added onto his policy and covered under his policy. So that if you get hurt, you know, somebody drops a hammer on your head, you're covered. It's an added layer of protection. Just make sure that, um, you know, it, it shouldn't cost him but a few dollars, but just make sure that you have that. Uh, you also get notified if the policy is canceled. It's another reason you want it. Sometimes contractors will go out They'll get a bid, get the declaration page, and then it's never, um, you know, never, never pay the premium. 
So they never had insurance in the first place, but you have a piece of paper that says they do. So that's, that's why you want the additional insured. Um, you want a photo ID with her current address. I got really taken advantage of by a contractor one time who uh, was working on a job, working on a job, and I was about three days slow in pulling the plug. And one day he just didn't show up for work. So I jumped in the car, went to his house, moved out two weeks ago. I was left holding the bag. Um, so, you know, you want a photo ID with his current address, all right? Um, and a W-9. W-9 is a tax form. Google it online. It's a, you know, basically it says it's a um, uh, tax, identif tax ID verification form. So you just know, you know, it, he fills it out. And um, at the end of the year, he's going to get 1099 from you, okay? Um, now let's talk about contract. The contract is really important. It's going to start with a clear description of the work. Now, we want to talk about the scope of the work. Very clearly, remove such and such items, tear down this wall, um, you know, frame out this area, replace it with this, this material. We want to have very, you know, a very clear description, both on the work that needs to be done, the materials that will be installed, um, and in and, and mo as many cases as you can, include the model number, the color, all of this stuff so that um, you, know, you have all the info. And, uh, and the quality of materials and um, you know, workmanship that is expected throughout the project. If these things are not clearly defined, a contractor could be following the letter of the, the agreement, but instead of putting in a beautiful decorative steel door on your on the front of the house. They could put in the uh, the cheapest special you know that, that they can find. The difference is eight hundred or a thousand dollars versus you know one hundred and fifteen dollars. It's great for them because they're saving money, but it's not so great for you when you're trying to you know present a a, a nice finished product to your buyer. Okay, so just make sure that's clearly defined. Next, define timelines. Finding timelines is very, very important. Time is money. So I set up my projects into phases. Phase one are, is, uh, is demolition and mechanicals. So I go into the project, I do my demo, I replace the electrical lines, the heating systems, the roof, um, the, uh, the windows, and uh, do any, any um, uh, rough plumbing work. That's phase one. Phase two is drywall and putting the pieces back together. That includes my walls, my floors, um, tiles and tile in the kitchen and bathrooms, um, just set up. And then we have finishes. That's phase three. Phase three is kitchens, finished bathroom, finished plumbing, finished electrical, um, paint work, like just getting everything else done. So phase one, I'll, I'll lay out to the contractor. Phase one is these items. And this is the time frame we're looking at. We're looking at a total project of five weeks or whatever it is in your case. Week one through three is phase one. Week four is phase two. Week five is phase three. Boom, there's your timeline. He's gonna have to sign off on that. And line up your payment schedule with your timeline. He's gotta understand that you do not pay for partially done work. You may be uh, responsible to buy the materials. It's okay. But you are not responsible to front him money to pay his guys, to pay his subcontractors, to pay him until the work is done. If the cost of putting in the rough electric is $4,000 for the house. When the rough electric is done and the city comes in and signs off on the permit that that part is done, stroke of a check, $4,000. No deposit, no nothing. Either do it or don't. This is really, really important. <laughs> Otherwise, you can run into work that is 75% done and you are 90% paid. If the contractor runs off, runs out of money, spends the money on something else, then you end up in a situation where you gotta dig deeper into your pocket to get the work done, or you gotta hire somebody else, and instead of being, you know, paying 25% for that remaining 25%, it's gonna cost you 50, <laughs> or it's gonna cost you 35. So it's gonna be money and money and money. So make sure you're only paying for completed work. And one thing that I do as well is I add bonuses and penalties 
um, to the contract. So we said time's money. If a job finishes on time, I can put it on the market just as planned and I can sell it within the time frame that I'm looking for. Sometimes a week can be the difference between hitting the spring or fall market and not. So time is really of the essence. I offer an incentive to my contractors. If they finish on or before the completion date, and when I say finish, I'm talking about not in the house, not, no punch list, no nothing, I give them a bonus. Sometimes it's a per day bonus, sometimes it's a flat, flat rate. You know, it might be an extra $500 or $1,000. On the flip side, if they do not finish by the due date, there's a per day fee. And that per day fee is $150. Every day that they are uh, not complete, and they should be, cost them $150. Bucks. These are things that, you know, you can manipulate the price, but I, I figure out what it costs me uh, to hold a property for a day, and that's what I put in the contract. This... When you get to the hiring process, you should have all of this stuff laid out before you have an appointment with your contractor. You ought to sit down with them and go over this point by point by point. Explain your reasoning for everything, and if there's any, uh, you know, if there's anything that they want to bring up, any rebuttals, any problems that they want to address, address them at that time. Because from here on out, you're managing the project, and you got to make sure that they're on on the same page as you with what you expect, what your process is, and you know. How, how the project's gonna go. Now, we move on to management. Managing a project is not that difficult. However, it does take focus and it does take initiative, all right? So, step number one is daily site visits. If you're managing the project, it's your project. It's your ob obligation to be at that property every single day that work is being done. This feeds in to the second point. Be unpredictable. Just because you're going to the job site doesn't mean you have to show up every morning when the work is supposed to start. I will either show up at the beginning of the day, the end of the day, or some random time. And I have an objective every time I go in the house. If I'm showing up at a random time, I want to make sure that they're working on the site. If I'm showing up in the morning, I whiteboard my project tasks. Phase one, these are the tasks that need to be done. This is the due date. I will take a whiteboard just like this one and I'll stand it up along the wall and I'll list the tasks that have to be done. Boom, 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 boom. And I'll go over it with the contractor when I'm there. This is what I expect. This is what I expect it to be done. Do you have any questions? Great. What are you going to work on today? Sometimes I'll even list. If they tell me, well, this is what we're going to have accomplished today, I'll write it down. Especially if time starts getting tight, I make them tell me what they're going to do and then I'll check it the next morning or check it that evening. It's the kind of thing where it keeps them accountable because it it shows them, you're just telling them to do what they said they were gonna do, okay? Um, as you manage the project, stick to the contract. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've done this myself, I've dealt with other uh, investors, other you know, coaching clients of mine, where everything to this point is perfect. We're showing up to the job site, management's great, and then we don't stick to the contract. Either we pay a little early, you know, the contractor's got a sob story. Look, my wife is, it's her birthday this weekend. I really need a paycheck. You know, can you do me a favor? Well, yeah, I can, but <laughs> you just got to get this phase done. When the phase is done, you get paid. It's, it's that simple. If you start bending the rules of the contract, your management is going to go out of control. It's very easy for a project to go haywire if you start pushing the limits there. Stick to your guns when it comes to the timelines and the payments. Very, very important. And the last point in management, the project will not go as planned. 100% of the time, something comes up. Uh, started a project three days ago, and what came up was a really fantastic thing. Um, I had budgeted in my project. I didn't have a chance to go up on the roof, so I had a budget to redo the roof. My roofing contractor, Climbed up on the roof and the roof was already done. He said, I'm not going to touch this. It was done three years ago. Great. Saves me money. Usually the money goes in the other way. I uh, had another project that I was working on that we were pl replacing the supply line, uh, um, supply lines for the plumbing. And I found out that there was a crack in the sewage line. Well, that's an expensive change. Had to rip it up, replace it. But the point is that with construction, you never really know what you're going to run into. 
when surprises occur, you need change work orders in writing. What a change work order is, is a small, it's basically an addendum to the contract. Your contractor is tearing down a wall, he finds a, um, you know, a, he, he finds that there's a support beam that is within that wall, he can't tear down the wall without adding a beam in. Okay, so what do you do? Write it down. Write down, this is the change in scope, this is going to be the, the time frame that is going to be added on to the original time frame, and this is the additional cost of the change. You know, sometimes if you've got to keep the budget right on, um, you might be substituting materials, you might be substituting scope in another area. You, instead of, you know, completely renovating a kitchen, maybe you keep the cabinets if we, have, if we run into something that's a problem, and we just reface them. You know, instead of putting granite countertops, we put in, uh, you know, a nice Formica countertop, something like that. But it's got to be in writing. Whatever, anytime there's a change, it's got to be in writing. And everybody has to know why uh, or what the change is going to be. So, you know, really, if you're looking for a new contractor um, and whether you're just looking to turn over a, an apartment or you're looking to rehab a, um, you know, investment property and, and get it on the market, it's really important that you control <laughs> the situation. Um, I hope that this has helped you and next time you're looking for a contractor, um, you can you know, find them, screen them, hire them, and manage them correctly so that, you know, it, it becomes a successful outcome instead of getting burned. This is the end of our, our training today. Till we see you again, I wish you the best of luck in your real estate investing.